the history and culture of the Philippines are reflected in the architectural heritage of the country, in dwellings and houses of worship, in mansions and monuments from Batanes to Tawi-Tawi. Man's earliest shelter was fashioned by nature herself on cliffs and mountainsides. The Tabon Cave of Palawan protected early Filipinos from tropical heat, wind and rain. Another shelter fashioned by nature was the tree, which provided a wide roof and an airy, multi-level habitation. If the tree was inadequate as shelter, it was nonetheless a good source of building materials. With twigs and branches forming the frame, and with leaves laid on as sidings, the lean-to is both roof and wall protecting its dwellers from wind and rain and from the heat of the sun. Being light and portable, it served the purpose of semi-nomadic groups such as the Aita. The ethnic house may assume different variations among the cultural communities throughout the archipelago. Almost always, however, this one-room house stands on stilts to protect the occupants from animals, floods, and the dampness of the ground. A steep roof allows rainwater to flow down easily. One type of ethnic house is the Ifugao Fale, which seems to be nothing more than a pyramid of thatch resting on wooden posts. Since part of the house serves as a granary, the posts are provided with rat guards in the shape of discs. The wooden parts of the house are joined by rabbiting and by mortise and tenon. Other parts are fastened by lashing. Since there are no metal nails, the house can be easily dismantled, transferred to a new site and reassembled. Next to the house stands a granary with the same shape as the house. With slanting walls meeting the sloping roof and with the low ceiling formed by a loft, the dark, windowless interior appears to be spherical, suggesting a womb. The solitary room serves as a sleeping room, kitchen, eating room, storeroom, and shrine for rituals. At one corner is a fireplace and above it a rack for storing and drying firewood and foodstuffs. Only husband and wife and youngest child live here, for upon reaching the age of reason, sons and daughters sleep in separate communal dormitories. While the early immigrants to the archipelago moved up to the mountains and settled there, the people of later migrations settled in the lowlands and along the coasts. The Samal are a people of the sea. The sea is their source of livelihood, their link to other people, and the place for celebration. It is also their home. The Samal built their houses on stilts over the water, along the shore or farther out. These houses are grouped together in villages and are connected by bridges and catwalks. With the establishment of Islam in Sulu and Mindanao in the 14th century, there arose two institutions which did not develop among other ethnic peoples, namely, a specific place for worship and the lordly residence of the ruler. Mosques in the Philippines follow the traditional Middle East design, which includes an onion-shaped dome and minarets. Closer to indigenous design is the mosque with a multi-tiered pyramidal roof resembling that of a pagoda. The word Torogan means a place for sleeping. But the Torogan house was more than that. It was a large, stately, towering one-room house 
owned only by a sultan or a datu. This royal residence was also used for village meetings, social gatherings, and religious rituals. The soaring, flaring roof is, like a ceremonial umbrella, a proclamation of exalted status. The massive posts serve as solid supports and signify established power. With the oversized posts resting on stones, the house sways with the earthquakes and playfully survives them. Flaring out from the facade are the intricately carved and stunningly colored panolong or protruding beam ends, which make the torogan appear to float like a royal barge. With cross and sword, Spain extended her empire to the Philippines in the 16th century. The Spanish colonizers first settled in Cebu in 1565. Six years later, in 1571, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi moved northward to fertile Luzon. He conquered Manila, which was located on the shores of a bay and at the mouth of a river, and therefore, eminently suitable for defense, administration, and trade. The Spaniards occupied the fort that had been abandoned by Raja Soleiman, ruler of Maynila. In time, the wooden palisades gave way to fortifications of stone, and a Spanish city took shape, following the prescriptions issued by King Philip II in 1573. The city was provided with a principal plaza and secondary plazas, and streets laid out in a gridiron pattern. Around the main plaza rose the government buildings and the cathedral, and nearby, houses of ranking persons. Manila became the capital of the colony and the model for town development. It was the geographic center of the colony, for the cross on the dome of the cathedral was the point from which distances were measured. With the influx of colonial officials, friars, missionaries, and traders, Manila became the center of political, religious, and economic power. To facilitate the work of evangelization and the administration of the colony, towns were established in subjugated areas and the scattered population was brought together in compact communities. Presiding over the town was the church, which had its own plaza, surrounded by a catenated or swayback wall. Adjacent to it was the convento, the residence of the parish priest. In plan, the church of the colonial era may be rectangular or shaped like a cross. The Church of Tayabas has an elaborate cruciform plan with rounded ends at the head and arms and rounded extensions at the intersection of the cross, suggesting the form of a key. Its large size and massive construction made the church a suitable place of refuge for the townspeople during pirate raids or natural calamities. Bell towers served as watchtowers. The church may be described as a plain stone box with a decorated front. While some church facades are extremely plain, others are richly ornamented. The front wall is traversed horizontally by cornices and vertically by columns. Niches, blind arches, blind balustrades and low relief carvings give depth, texture, and a certain cheerfulness to vast solid expanses of wall. Ornaments may be in the classic tradition, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, or Baroque and Rococo. Occasionally, one sees Gothic, Romanesque, or Moorish trefoil arches.
thick walls of churches are usually made of adobe stone. Walls may also be of coral stone or brick, or a combination of brick and adobe in alternate horizontal courses or in a checkerboard pattern. Buttresses which strengthen the walls against earthquakes come in various shapes. Flat and thin, massive and rectangular, sloping, stepped, sawtooth, barrel-shaped, and curved. Bell towers vary in design as well as in location. In plan, the bell tower may be square, octagonal, hexagonal, or in rare instances, circular. In height, it may rise from three to five stories. It may be attached to the church or separated from it, or it may be integrated in the facade. Some churches have two towers, a few have three. Being the principal feature of the church, the altar is lavishly and indulgently decorated as these Baroque and Rococo retablos testify. Twisted columns, called Salomonica, fluted columns, cherubs and medallions, fruits, flowers and shells, garlands and festoons, scrolls and volutes, gilded ornaments and lively colors, all formed an exuberant shrine for solemn-looking saints. The abundance and exuberance of ornament is a celebration of life and a joyful proclamation of faith. The colonial churches were designed by Spanish friars using European churches as their models. But the builders, artisans and craftsmen who came from the native population or the Chinese colony interpreted and modified these European designs according to their skill, imagination, and taste. Whenever they could, they introduced local motifs, fruits, flowers, or a crocodile head. More than these, they expressed something of their spirit, their simplicity and lightheartedness, and their love for abundance. Thus, in the colonial church, we find the marriage of European design in native craftsmanship and the emergence of Filipino Baroque. that the Spanish colonizers found were probably not too different from the Bahay Kubo, which is home for most rural lowland Filipinos. This variation of the ethnic house is basically a one-room dwelling covered by a steep roof and raised on stilts. Largely of bamboo and thatch, with parts woven, fitted, or tied together, it is less of a building and more of a basket. The bamboo floor with slats set slightly apart like the bottom of a basket makes for incomparable ventilation. With air coming in through windows and floor, the Bahai Kubo is a house that breathes. The 19th century townhouse, called the Bahay Nabato, was a product of economic and social developments. With the opening of Manila to international trade in 1834 and the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, trade in agricultural production increased the fortunes of the provincial aristocracy. Educated in Manila, 
and sometimes in Europe, the educated elite or illustrados included landowners, traders, and professionals. The lifestyle, aspirations, and even pretensions of this new upper class demanded a new type of dwelling, spacious, durable, comfortable, impressive, noble, and elegant. Architecturally, the Bahay na Bato may have borrowed its steep roof, elevated quarters, and maximized ventilation from the Bahay Kubo, its capaciousness from the native chieftain's capacious timber house described by Antonio de Morga in the 17th century, its combination of native and foreign styles from the two-story houses of wood and stone built in Intramuros after the 1645 earthquake, and its design and construction from the convento of the mission church. The Bahay Nabato may be described as a house with wooden legs and a stone skirt. This type of construction gives the house flexibility and stability, especially during earthquakes. Large wooden posts are sunk into the ground and stand high enough to carry the roof, but remain independent of both the stone wall and the wooden walls above. The saguan, with its naked stonework, is a grim entrance hall, but with its abundant space is the perfect storeroom for rice bins, carros, and carruajes. The stairs lead up to the caída, or upper entrance hall, which connects to the huge sala where carved or bent wood chairs are grouped around tables of wood and marble. Flanking the sala are bedrooms whose typical furniture include four poster beds, tall aparadores for clothes, lavaderas or wash stands, pillow and mat containers, and altars for household saints. Near the sala, too, is the comedor, or dining room, which features long wooden tables and elaborate plateras for storing imported china and silverware. At the rear of the house are the kitchen with its stove, tables, and benches, and next to it, the open-air azotea, which usually has steps leading down to the river or to a backyard. Running along the front and sides of the house and flanking the major rooms is the volada, a gallery which protects the rooms from the heat of the sun. Along the volada is an elaborate system of windows. The broad, massive window sill is grooved and holds two sets of sliding shutters, a set of wooden louvers or jalousies and a set of capis or oyster shell shutters, or a set of glass pane shutters. Between the window sill and the floor runs the ventanilla with sliding wooden shutters and wooden balustrades or iron grills. Running above the partitions are panels of wooden fretwork which allow the air within the house to circulate. Wide double doors are flung open to join adjacent rooms. With all doors open, the house becomes one big hall. The interior of the Bahay Nabato is a striking example of space surrounded by space. In the evolution of Philippine architecture, the architect as a professional who plans, designs, and supervises construction began to appear in the Spanish colonial era. Foreign-trained Felix Rojas Sr., who is considered the first Filipino architect, was renowned for his revivalist designs for the neo-Gothic Santo Domingo and the neoclassic San Ignacio, both in Intramuros. Maestro de Obras, Arcadio Arellano, was appointed architectural advisor 
to Governor William Howard Taft in 1901 and is known for works like the Gothic Revival House of the Hidalgo family and the Art Nouveau Bautista Nakpil House. In the middle of the 19th century, Bartolome Palatino, a noted citizen of the wood-carving town of Paete, designed and built the splendid facade of the church at Morong, Rizal. With the occupation of the Philippines by the United States in 1898, urban planning and architecture served more secular ends. In 1904, the American architect Daniel H. Burnham surveyed Manila and Baguio and recommended, among others, the establishment of a government center with streets radiating from it, the retention, cleaning, and improvement of the esteros, the construction of a Bayshore Boulevard from Manila to Cavite, the development of parks and waterfronts, and the provision of sites for major public facilities. In executing Burnham's plan, William E. Parsons designed buildings to serve American colonial policy, especially in the areas of health, public education, free enterprise, and training in self-government. The Filipino architects of the early 20th century included Carlos Barreto, Antonio Toledo, Tomas Mapua, Tomas Arguelles, and Juan Arellano, all trained abroad and influenced by the Beaux-Arts School. They designed government buildings of neoclassical style and monumental scale. While the neoclassical style was the rule, there were some striking exceptions, namely the Renaissance and the Romantic. During the period, new house forms developed, following the tone set by William Parsons and turning away from the ornaments of the Bahay Nabato, the suburban house, or chalet, popularly known as chalet, was sensible, functional, and in many cases, plain. The 1930s were a time for looking forward more confidently to national independence. They also marked the emergence of the Filipino business magnet who rose from rags to riches in the heady atmosphere of free enterprise. The developing economy demanded new types of buildings, commercial office buildings, apartments, movie houses, and homes for the upper class. Into this environment of progress and experiment, the young architects, Andres Luna de San Pedro, Pablo Antonio, and Juan Acpil, made an auspicious entrance. Modern architecture in the Philippines was a departure from the neoclassic Beaux-Arts tradition. But like the local neoclassic, it was still a product of foreign influence, a transplant from the West. While it was hailed as innovation, it was basically a new conformism to Western trends. At the end of the Second World War, Manila was in ruins. The irreplaceable treasure that was intramuros was reduced to rubble. The once magnificent government buildings were bombed out shelves. Hasty reconstruction resulted in makeshift structures with false fronts. The atrocities of war were followed by atrocities of reconstruction. While the established architects resumed their practice, new graduates began to enter the field. As the work of reconstruction advanced, the language of contemporary Filipino architecture developed. Its vocabulary expanded, its forms of expression became clearer, and from the muddled and the prosaic, it moved on to poetry.
rapid increase of population demanded low-cost housing on a large scale. Government housing projects catered to the low-income group, while private developers served the needs of the middle and high-income groups. With the rapid expansion of residential areas came the concentration of retail and service establishments in commercial centers and shopping malls. Super buildings rose to accommodate under one sprawling roof, shops, supermarkets, restaurants, movie houses, amusement centers, and even medical clinics. With land rising in value, the use of urban space was maximized through vertical expansion. Until the 1950s, the height of buildings was restricted by ordinance to 30 meters, or about 10 stories. But since the development of Makati, high-rise buildings have daringly exceeded that limit, going up to 25 floors, and now aiming beyond 40. In the variety of houses and buildings that emerged through centuries of Philippine history, from one end of the archipelago to the other, a common spirit can be discerned. One feature of the Filipino house and of Filipino architecture is the concept of spaces as interrelated, outdoor and indoor space, in the various areas of indoor space. In other words, space surrounded by space. In a tropical climate, a house must breathe. Thus, transparency is a feature of the Filipino house. It allows for cross-ventilation and better circulation of air. The light-heartedness of the Filipino is reflected in the visual lightness of his architecture. A structure appears to be a floating volume. Massive structures are decorated in such a way that they look light. The Filipino, who lives in a lush Baroque landscape, seems not to be comfortable with empty space or plain unadorned surfaces. Space has to be filled or broken up, or at least be the setting for texture. The play of space, visual lightness, transparency of structure and texture, all contribute to a spirit of festivity. The Filipino loves his fiestas, so that even a revolution becomes like one, and architecture becomes one of his forms of celebration. Filipino architecture has been a search for form and a search for identity. Now it must turn to the search for a new purpose. Present conditions demand that architecture serve the needs of the greater majority of the population who have long been deprived of the benefits of development. Clearly, the larger task of architecture today is to create new communities for the poor in order to raise them from the inhumanity of poverty to a way of life worthy of their human dignity. Architecture for the poor will help to answer the long urgent need to redesign and renew the social order.